to it. This is the NeoBooks call on Monday, February 12th, 2024. Uh, Stuart was just talking about the virtues of zoominess, I think, and being as close to telepathy as we can get to. Triggered by me saying I was just reading his comment to the OGM list replying to Ken, but here he is in the flesh, kind of, and we're sort of there. Um, and feel free to keep going on that for, for a bit if you want, Stuart. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, studying spiritual phenomenon and and and, and other psychic phenomenon, you know, the some of the aspiration of higher consciousness is is telepathic communication. And, you know, when we first started to have this kind of technology, my immediate thought was, oh great, <laughs> we've got we've got telepathic communication. Um here it is in some in some sense. Mm -hmm. And I will copy right now a link of a video of Cleo Abram, who is a really good and fun tech commentator analyst on YouTube. And she did a video about the Apple Vision Pro <clears throat> in which she says the thing she looks forward to most <laughs> about the Apple Vision Pro is that it is as close to teleportation as we as we seem to be able to get. And I'm a wee bit skeptical about her claim but I found it interesting nonetheless. Yeah, I also, that just brings up for me, I also saw somewhere recently the um, the price tag of it. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was not an inexpensive purchase. <laughs> oh, not at all, not at all. <laughs> it was a kind way of, of, of saying that, you know, it, it's, a it's, a, it's a pricey purchase. It is. Well, it's 3500 list and you'll spend 4500 by the time you buy the case and some lenses and uh, an extra battery and a couple of things like that. Yeah. Stacey, thank you for connecting with us while you drive. You're you're actually even pulled over. Super. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to like drive off the road if we distract you too much. That's really good. Um, we left last call and Pete is not on right now. He may join. We left last call uh, in that we were going to have a conversation about a taxonomy of uh, different kinds of collective authorship. I will post the link in the chat. And uh, Pete and I didn't have a chance to go do more on it uh, in between. So I'm thinking we should probably just postpone that. But I also wanted to do a little bit of after action review because it feels like my choosing that topic didn't work so well on our call last week. And um, for that reason, sort of Pete and I were gonna go off and see if we could like munch and crunch and improve the topic some and come back with something that was more useful to the conversation. But but I I was under the impression at least that 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 was not a great topic to pick for us to to go into and we didn't we didn't enjoy or or make much progress going into it. I, I like the call, but I like all our calls. Um, and any thoughts you have, uh, if you remember what that call was, uh, please jump in now. Well, well, since Rick maybe was... you could start by saying what you felt was useful about it, uh, Jerry, just to jog our memories. <laughs> um, sure, and then and then to Stuart as well. Um, so for me, uh, I have been studying groupware slash computer supported collaborative work slash social media slash whatever the hell you want to call it since my first moments as a tech industry analyst back in '88. Uh, I've always cared about how computers mediate human communication and been through and read and even suggested a couple frameworks for how all that stuff works and care a lot about a lot of the subtleties maybe of how we help each other, how we uh, amplify and improve others' comments, how we suppress or dissent to the comments we disagree with. All that stuff is really, really, really fascinating to me and I think important to civilization because talking online allows us to talk a lot more a lot more often and a lot more broadly for zero marginal cost than face to face the face to face stuff that we used to be limited by uh, and certainly then even then the publishing industries and other kinds of recording and uh, media industries because until the internet those were all very limited to get a book published you had to find a publisher who would nod and say yes and then you had to write a book and then so very few people had kind of written books and all of a sudden, it seems like lots and lots and lots of people have written books, uh, et cetera. So that, that, that's a piece of it. So for me, we turned over that soil a bunch. 
And where we got bogged down was in kind of our agreements or disagreements about what that means and how it might be applied. And we went back to, well, this needs to be made really pragmatic. Uh, it's not pragmatic yet. This is such an abstract conversation. And I was like, no, 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 it's really pragmatic because Pete and I are talking about which of these affordances to add to the NeoBooks project and to his massive wiki right now. And if we do that early well, then it plays out well. But that didn't that didn't sell uh, in this in this group. I don't I don't think. So that's kind of where I was. But that's a piece of the of, of the conversation that I, that that is memorable to me right now. Uh, Stuart, if you wanted to jump in. Well, I was just I was just going to say, um, not being a person of 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 technology i'm wondering where this conversation is going and when we're going to do some production of neo books we could talk about what they are and what the taxonomy is and what the details of it from now until doomsday <laughs> but i'm i'm just i'm getting a little antsy that's my you know and I just wanted to get that out there. I've, I've mentioned it to to Jose, um, and 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 here we are. I mean, I thought a, a few months ago we were getting close, you know, with Klaus's project, and then all of a sudden we've other people have joined, and um, and and here we are, you know, kind of ruminating about the things we've been we've been talking about. Um, so that's my. That, I just wanted to put that out there at the beginning of the call. Mm -hmm. and, and I think what you just said, Stuart, is a perfect example of my impression of how last week's call didn't actually go over well. And, <laughs> and, and my intention is not to drive us back into the topic now. I just wanted to debrief on it briefly. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we need to go there. And I still have the impression that doing that makes the NeoBooks project actually work better, but isn't about publishing a kindle or epub neo book because it's beyond that it's like oh what's it going to be like if if we're telling people that coming in here and interacting with the nuggets is the important part of neo books that's different from a regular book then the abstract thinking that we talked about last week needs to be fixed but i'm happy to do that offline and separately with pete um, and i agree with you i'm impatient also for us to get books out the closest we've come to that is pete and me uh, going through Klaus's manuscript and trying to figure out how to automatically or manually chunk it up into nuggets and break it up into markdown pieces. Ironically, our desire to do that and disaggregate it so that it feels like a neobook and so that the chunks are actually um, interact interactable and reusable um, will be a, a waypoint on the way back to maybe a Google Doc and maybe a Word Doc because that seems to be the path over to Pandocs, which is the software that helps you spit out uh, EPUBs, right? And so there's this irony that thinking about neobooks and trying to make a neobook is going to sort of add work to the process, and neither Pete nor I have the time resources to be a, an actual line editor and composer and other kinds of things. That's why we're trying to figure out how to automate it, and it turns out that the automated export includes a whole bunch of funny codes and stuff like that that lingers in from Google Docs that we want to know what we're doing about eliminating, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm trying to figure out how do we short circuit that so that we can spit out an ebook ASAP. And by the way, I'm not saying that it's not that these conversations aren't important, um, you know, to know where we're going before we actually move into a production space. But, um, you know, you can't know everything. And, and at some point in time, you got to just <laughs> begin. Yeah. I total, totally agree. Um, Klaus, Klaus, then Rick. Nine days. Yeah, I'm also in this. Uh, let's just begin to do something. So some mud against the wall camp of things, right? <laughs> so what I what I would envision is something similar to this website here to put a user interface up there, make it really interesting and sexy, you know, to to uh, for people to get uh, uh, onto it. Um, you can charge uh, a membership fee for something like this, and then you can list all these ebooks that we have so far, even in developmental stage, and give them an entry point. So I don't think there's a great need, Jerry, for you and Pete to rewrite these books or uh, um, you know, do a lot with the text. 
because when you create subchapters, you, you have a website, a, a, a user interface, you know, uh, that uh, um, that allows you to enter. Then you see here, here are the titles, and you get into one of the titles, and then that title may be split up in nuggets. I, mean, that's, I just think something as simple as this, just move. You know? And then as uh, as something as we learn more and we get feedback from uh, people using this. We can improve it, but I, I, I just, I just think you know, there has to be a starting point somewhere. Um, Klaus, you have, you have made, probably unintentionally just opened up a different can of worms, which is connecting these neo books to ChatGPT and creating GPTs around them, which I agree is an important and interesting thing, but is a step beyond the simple creation of what smells and looks like a book. You may be saying let's just skip that and let's just create some GPTs connected to the material we think belongs in a book. And I'm trying to go through the process of having a book that shows up with an ISBN, ISBN number and, and is, is available for purchase on Amazon, which may be a time sync digression after all. So there's, there's a conversation that we've touched a little bit here, which is, hey, does chat GPT sort of obsolete note-taking and bookmaking? And do we just talk to the GPTs, which I think is what you're saying. No, that's not what I'm saying. Okay, I just I'm, I'm just suggesting to put a user interface you know, uh, up there uh, where you can get into a book and maybe there maybe some of the books have a chat GPT interface uh, in addition to the book itself, right? You can ask me questions here or whatever, but uh, but in general, I just think just have a basic website, you know, with uh, uh, places to enter and. Uh, uh, allowing access to individual books with or without chat GPT. Okay, sorry, but pi.ai is one of those GPT, one of those uh, LLMs. And I thought because you gave us a pi link that you meant front ending them entirely with GPTs. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I mean, I just grabbed a website uh, that looked like something I can visualize for this purpose. Okay, thank you. Simple UI. Something very simple that just like leads you into the, the material. Okay, um, Rick, then Jose. Yeah, I just have to go at uh, top of the hour just to let you know. Um, yeah, no, I enjoyed last week. I, 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 but on the other hand, I, I share Stuart's uh, feelings about let's let's do something. And I just want to bring notice to something Klaus put in LinkedIn where he asked it a question, gave a response, and my response, maybe you responded to my question. And what it was, was, you know, what needs to be improved and what's missing in the response to AI. And I, I think coming in with little sort of, um, you know, sort of micro projects, so to speak, that are set up, that is part of the doing and learning of this and particularly using AI. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, I'm interested in expanding the metaphor beyond nuggets. Um, but really the outcome that I'm much more interested in is how can you design these uh, neo books to create ongoing intergenerational learning communities? And uh, that's what I'm more interested in. And so I've written a blog post, which is an attempt to sort of move in that direction. And at some point down the road, if people are interested, and I think this applies to anyone, put some of your writing up for critic critique prior to a meeting and let's do a deep dive into something. And let people, you know, rip on it, you know, and see what comes out of it. So, uh, uh, you know, this this would just, you know, close this the circle between theory and practice. So, that's my two cents. Uh, thanks, Rick. And just to remind us, can you post a link to that post in the chat? Yeah, here? So yeah, I, I, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. do that. Okay. <clears throat> thanks. There it is. Yep. Cool. Uh, Jose, you had your hand up a moment ago. Did you mean to still have it up? I didn't realize I didn't have it up still. Um, so I sent the email or message or something to Pete and yourself um, about what I was hearing as far as, as um, how we wanted to structure things. And I, I went kind of meta and tried to understand where you guys were going, which was a lot more low level than what I was thinking. Um, which I, I guess we would need to do at some point, but I was trying to wrap my head around it at a, at a higher level. And one of the things that 
I wondered was what you were calling, um, sorry, I call them building blocks. You call them something else, nuggets. Nuggets. Um, what you were calling nuggets seemed to me to not just be textual blocks, but conceptual blocks. Right. Um, and that conceptual blocks, when we interact with conceptual blocks, that what we would want to do is, is build a conceptual frame by which those conceptual blocks would then be, you know, we could interact with. And so if, if we say, okay, well, I'm going to, and I think I used in that, in that email, um, the concept that, you know, Klaus is, is basing his work on some conceptual principles, right? And he's saying, oh, you know, food is a biological thing. There's biological needs for people and the, the food is a biological process and we can understand these two things. And what we need to do is regulate these two things into coming together in, in the form of uh, good available food without destroying the soil and, and make them available to, to human needs. But very simple conceptual frame for what Klaus is working on. It may not actually be accurate, but that's, that's what I was uh, depicting. And that the work we're doing is is similar. It has the similar foundational blocks of of you know we're talking about biological processes. These biological processes, if understood and accepted, don't allow for a lot of the crap that that comes out of of other ways of framing things. So we could actually share some of the same foundational blocks. Um, conceptual foundational blocks. And and then the words that we use to describe those things or frame those things and, and beyond that would be unique, but they would be tied to these things that we could then argue and have different views on and and have different ways of depicting them and, and so on and so forth. It seems to me it creates a, a way for us to fragment these books that isn't just a bunch of words. Otherwise, in my mind, and maybe I'm missing something, but in my mind, if we take a book, say, you know, 20,000 words, small book, and we fragment it up into chunks, um, arbitrarily, somewhat arbitrarily, um, then now we've got, you know, what, a thousand, two thousand, three thousand chunks that no one can really hold any structure around unless those chunks are kind of grounded in some way. And I'm, I know that I'm being quite structural here in, in my definition and what I'm envisioning. And you said, I think in your reply, that if it was that kind of rigid a structure that you wouldn't be interested in it. I don't understand how we how we chunk things without having some structure to those chunks. If if the chunks are just you know anything that's roughly a hundred words, that's a chunk and makes a sentence and nope. you know whatever. Then yeah, that's, that's not a chunk, definitely. Okay, so so I need to understand that uh, yeah. for me to be able to to play in the space that you guys are playing in. Um, and I'm, I'm listening hard to you because I don't, I'm not sure we're that far apart in how we're thinking about this, but we're probably a little apart in how we're thinking of implementing this or how we think it should look. Um, and so let me explore this a little bit with you here. Um, I'm not sure how you pick and choose what a foundational block is in the way I'm hearing you. It's like, if I want a foundational block, well, the Wikipedia has a page about carbon or carbon sequestration that you might think of as a foundational block or a nugget because it's an explanation vetted by a community of experts, sort of in the Wikipedia style, that's very referenceable. It's a nice way to centralize or crystallize the argument about it, but it makes it hard to have an opinion or tell a story around, it doesn't make it hard, but you can't on the page for carbon 
um, express a narrative around carbon that that is an opinion you hold around carbon sequestration, what's good or what's bad. So right. that opinion to me is a nugget that that would then probably decompose into smaller nuggets because your opinion, Klaus's opinion, that regenerative agriculture uh, and other forms of improving the food system represent the best payoff for humans trying to address climate change in present is an argument. That argument breaks down into 500 or 15, or I don't know how many different nuggets or blocks that he's building on, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, here are all the payoffs for regenerative agriculture. Here, are, uh, it, it just goes, it goes, it's turtles all the way down kind of. And each turtle is in some sense a nugget that might even contain other nuggets or blocks. And of those, I think for each of us, some of those would be more important than others. Mm -hmm. and, and and maybe the word is foundational. And I, I like that a lot, but I don't know that we would agree on which nuggets are foundational. And I'm really interested personally in the process of which of these bubble up to become most attractive, most important, most supported by a lot of people, because I think those might become your foundational blocks, but I don't think you can start by declaring them. I think they emerge from the interactions of the community over time and maybe never get labeled foundational, or maybe each of us individually says, oh, and of all the blocks or nuggets that I care about, these are my foundational ones. And then we see how that plays out in the aggregate. Does that yeah, make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm not okay. suggesting that yeah. we agree, here's our 50 you know, foundational That's blocks. What I was hear on... That's what I was hearing you say. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is, here's my, give Hold me a, on, stir, a second, stir. thanks. You know, let me assert mine. Right. This is what I've got. This is what I'm asserting. Oh, by the way, I really like what Klaus is starting with that thing. I'm going to tie one of mine to Klaus's thing. Right. Because that that makes sense. Right. And and oh, Stuart's got two or three that are good. What the hell? I've never seen that one. I love laser it. light show. It's good. Uh, I've never seen Actually, it. Actually, I, I can also do confetti. Yeah. Yeah. There we, you go. All right. All right. Yeah. I, I do the confetti. Um, <laughs> you have to have the latest Mac OS running and Stuart does. <laughs> this is, this is a laser love light it, show. Love it, love it, love it. Love it. <laughs> Klaus, uh, Klaus, just do the peace symbol for a second. I think, <laughs> are you on Macintosh class? There you go. There you, you go. Them. Good. So um, you have, you have all the gestures as well. Rick, don't move it around. Leave it next to your head. There you go. You've got everybody on the call. Stacy, you're on your phone, so we don't know, but, and I think you're on windows. It only works on Mac OS on desktops. Otherwise, uh, it looks like you're okay. having a, you're doing a peace symbol. Yeah, I'm on my phone getting back in the car. Exactly. Okay, I'm going. But thanks thanks for was, trying. What was the other one? There was there was one that I missed. This this is um, I got that laser one. light. That's show. a laser light show. Two thumbs up is fireworks. Two thumbs down is rainstorm. One thumb up is a thumbs up amplified. Uh, come on. There we go. One thumb down is a thumbs down amplified. Uh, and then a single one of these is balloons. Two of these is confetti. <laughs> Can I just say that something before I go off? This yes. was adorable, but I really wanted to hear the last part of what Jose was saying. And I'm wondering if he lost his train of thought. <laughs> we're, we're going back to it now. And I apologize for the digression. Thanks, Stacey. How do you do, how do, you do confetti? Uh, two. Two peace signs. Thank you. They're also all in the menu. If you look at your menu bar, there should be a little video camera in a green rectangle. If you click on that, you can individually trigger them just by going through the menus there. Thank you. Uh, back to you in the booth for what you were saying before, Jose. <laughs> um, yes. So they're emergent. They're not predefined. Um, they become communal. In other words, I like what you're going. Let's talk about this. Let's share this. Let's create our foundational block. Can we agree on this? That'd be a cool foundational block for us to agree on. Um, because I think that gets us down the road as a community. And, so, yeah. and hey, I've just written this text related to that foundational block. And uh, can you can you vet this text? See if it resonates to you and how you're using that foundational block. And 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 we can maybe build a bridge between what we're, we're talking about. I'm talking about, you know, Klaus is talking about food and I'm talking about something else. That's okay. Is it still grounded in that foundational block? 
to me, that's the beauty of 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 this. And if it sounds like this is what we're we're talking about the same thing, and I in no way am suggesting that we prescribe what those foundational blocks can or should be from day one. Um, if, if I, was, I just go ahead, Stuart. I just I'll wanted to jump the clarify. queue here because I think it's important. Sorry, guys. Um, Jose, I heard you intimate that the way things would be broken up into chunks was just something structural. And Jerry, I assume that the way things would be broken up into chunks has some will have some intelligence to it, some AI component in some ways. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to clarify that and make sure that was that we all understood that. Thank and you. we've we've talked a bit on these calls about nuggetization, the yeah. process of creating these nuggets that are kind of holons of information that yeah. might include other holons, et cetera. And I think, Jose, the question you're bringing up, <laughs> um, the more I think about how we were agreeing, this is about the nomenclature for the process. Like, what do we call it when you and I agree on something and we both think that thing is important? Is it a foundational block? Is it something else? What do we call that process of agreement? How do we make it visible to other people? I think those things we all have to figure out and bubble out of this process. And those are crucially important for the hope that I have for what neobooks are that's different from a regular book. Is that good for you? Yeah, yeah. No, no. If, if, if it sounds like we're on the same page, how we get there is a slightly different story. But I think... Uh, for me, I couldn't go forward without understanding that we were on that page, because if we're just talking about text, then we're screwed. Bingo. And thank you for asking these really interesting kind of complicated questions and for sitting through the, the discussions that clarify them, because they're really clarifying for the whole project. So really appreciate that. Um, Klaus, then Rick. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, from my you know, structural mindset here um to me foundational for example would be nature-based systems social systems energy systems right and under nature-based systems you can bring in dave with his uh nate uh, what is he working on landscape ideas you can bring in garden world right so you have a block of nature-based solutions um social systems design you know could be another block then when it comes to nuggets, there's a certain logic that just that just evolves. Like uh, when we wrote the first book, we had, uh, we gave it to several people. Uh, um, Bill was one of them. And he declared, this is not one book, these are three books. Right? Because they, in his mind, they were totally, three totally different topics. And then I had to clarify how they are connected. Um, and so, so you have a, a sort of an intuitive structure for what are the nuggets in this story, because it sort of falls apart uh, when you when you look at this uh, from from a topical perspective, right? But I would lay out a structure first, so you have a some kind of categorization where things fall into. Now, then they are discussions in Garden World, in Doug's Garden World, in my uh, uh, book, that would fall under social, right? I mean, you can take a nugget out of my book and put it into, uh, uh, take uh, spiral dynamics and put it wherever, yeah? And so so that's sort of how I how I was looking at these, uh, uh, at, at this kind of format, but you have to have some kind of orientation for someone, mm -hmm. let's say we create a URL, you know, you open up, you look at this. How do you orient yourself? How do you know, you know, what you might be interested at looking uh, to look at? Right. So you you have a guidance system that uh, leads you towards. Oh, I want to you know, look at it. what's happening in energy. Who's writing what in that field? Uh, and, and so so that's sort of where I was mm -hmm. uh, coming from. Go ahead and say that. I'll jump in. I I was just gonna say that I I think. For me, what Klaus just said speaks to two ways then of getting at these neo books. I can um, get into a neo book through these foundational blocks, where I could say, "Oh, that's an interesting one. Somebody said that this is a thing that's foundational, and it leads to these three books. Very interesting. Three people are, are working on these things with this foundational view." 
Um, and then I can go and look at, oh, we're talking about food. That's cool. And I can get down to the foundational view, right? So however I come in to touch up on these things or interact with them, uh, and to me, I'm less um, worried about the interaction up the stream than I am at downstream. I'd rather people engage downstream uh, because that fundamentally changes so many more opportunities upstream, right? Don't just talk about how I wrote something and so on and so forth, or my necessary, my subject matter, but the foundational blocks that I'm working with. Because if, if we can get the foundational blocks better, then how we then um, express those things moving forward is more consistent across our community of, of new book authors, right? Um, yes, and I think what you're talking about in the discussion we're having right now points out the complexity of having reusable nuggets in, in that we're trying to get to what you're saying, that there are different paths into different ideas, that different people use different nuggets in different ways for different narratives, that when you look at a nugget, you can say, oh, this nugget exists, this actual text right here lives in three different books written by three different authors or two different authors because the same nugget showed up in two different ways by the same author or something like that. And how do you follow those paths and how do you make those arguments so that that, and in, and that particular nugget might be improving over time as somebody offers edits to it and suggestions to it that make it a clearer argument or make the case better or whatever else. And as long as it still fits in the flow or the narrative flow of the books that it connects to, we're golden. Um, if it breaks those narratives, then you might have to stay with the older version of the same nugget, and yet you're still related. You're still kind of connected into the web of ideas. Um, Klaus, when when Bill suggested that there may be three books that you have, um, I was puzzled, and we, we I don't think we had this conversation, but I have a feeling that your book, as you your original manuscript as it was, was kind of one book because I saw the narrative you were trying to build, the narrative arc. But I think Bill read it as three books because it wasn't connected. It, the, the ligatures, the connective tissue in prose wasn't quite there yet. It wasn't making, you you weren't bridging one to the other uh, as much as, as could have been done, but it felt like one book. And then it felt like you could totally take the latter half of the book, add some more material to it and say, hey, here's a pragmatic use of spiral dynamics uh, with a case study in regenerative agriculture. And that would be its own separate standalone book about how to apply spiral dynamics. And it could reuse a bunch of the chapters uh, or nuggets that you had already written. And then somebody else might take some pieces of what you wrote and do something different with it. Uh, again, the repurposability or reuse of these nuggets being <clears throat> really important to the whole NeoBooks concept. But does that make sense? Well, don't forget that uh, you and Stuart were with me you know, throughout the writing process and you kept asking me questions, which then made me go back and update it. Yep. Bill did not participate in any of these discussions, and he saw this whole thing for the first time, and that's how he came up with these are three seemingly unrelated topics. They were not unrelated to us because we had talked through them. And so that was really a very important contribution that Bill made there by, by asking, you know, uh, uh, by no, uh, sharing his observation and asking questions about it. And I think that's also... This kind of process is very helpful you know, to develop a new book, you know, so that you have uh, sort of a real life check review. You have to, you explain what you're trying to express, and it may not come across, and you, then you go back. So, so when Bill said that, there's two, at least more than two, but there's two different answers you might have to that. One of them is to break the manuscript up into three different books. The other one is to weave the three pieces together so that they feel more like one book. Which of those directions? Uh, resonates for you? Well, I mean, obviously, I had one topic, right? And I wanted to get to that topic in the most, uh, uh, to, you know, in a way that allows you to communicate. So the first thing was, here's the story, right? And then it's like, and here's like how you have to communicate this story, because obviously the issues with people receiving, you know, what you're talking about here. And then thirdly, now that we have had this conversation, how do you go about fixing stuff? And that's when you get into theory, you, right? Because here is a is a social systems 
uh, management, change management process structure mm -hmm. right, that guides you. So to, to, that's the logic connection between those three. So to me, it's one story. Yeah. Good. Me too. And, and to me as well, Klaus. Thank you. Um, or sorry, yeah. Stuart. Sorry to make you wait, Stuart. Jump on no in. Wor no worries. So, so I think what we're talking about is um, some kind of an editorial process. Yes. Um, before stuff is is released, mm -hmm. and 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 understanding what our editorial process is, uh, and, and I I I, you know, from my own background and experience, you know, some folks go with like one editor. My response is no. You know, <laughs> you need multiple views to get a, a much better to get the best product that you can. Mm -hmm. And and your question opens opens some really interesting doors in that editorial process. If we were if this was a if this was Houghton Mifflin or Norton or something, a, a well known book publisher or BK, um, they would have uh, a, a content a, a content editor. They would have a line editor. They'd have a couple of different kinds of edit passes, and you would step through those in a very well known structure and and timing that would yep. turn into a, into a finished book thing. Yeah, we're we don't have the resources to have each of those editors paid to do the the proper job they do. We do have a light little crowd of people who might crowdsource some editing, which is really interesting. And then we have this hope that the nuggets are interesting enough that people would come in and sort of curate them over time beyond the publication of the first version of the book, which is something that just never happens, right? You you you're done with a book. The author might go back and do an updated and revised edition a decade later. That happens, but it happens seldom. And here we're saying that the contents of a good book should be alive and lively and improving just over time. And they should be, you know, included in other books that that emerge afterward. And that just like uh, modern music sampling, uh, prior music and riffing on it is a homage to the previous tunes, that we would do exactly the same thing which would be different from just quoting a couple paragraphs or a couple lines from another book, which is common practice in books now. It would be different because we would actually be reusing whole nuggets, uh, which is which is kind of a scaling up of, hey, I'm just quoting a couple sentences because I like what what uh, Sue wrote, you know, three decades ago. So here's what I'm envisioning when when, um, and I, I'd like to also speak to the to this um, editing idea, but. Um, or editorial process, but but here's what I'm envisioning as as how a nugget might show up in um, in a in a document, right? So here's a paragraph as I'm scrolling down the page, and that when I'm on a paragraph, that paragraph highlights in comparison to the paragraph above or below, or maybe a, a sentence or whatever the case may be, and that there's a a, a nugget block or a a block that shows up that says, hey, this has got a foundational thing on it. And poof, pop up, here's the foundational thing. You can click on that foundational thing. You can go read it. You can interact with it. You can have fun with it. But but each piece links back to foundational statements, building blocks that are back there that I want to, to, to be bound to in this specific paragraph or specific sentence or whatever it is. And that the editorial process actually, for me, starts with a community conversation around what are good blocks to start with. For me, not that you telling me what they are, but if mm -hmm. I say, listen, I want to start with this. Oh, we already have a block for that. Here's where it is. And here's how it's framed. No, nope, not good for me. I want to fork it. I want to start another block. It's different. It's not the same as yours. Uh, or it's not the same as one that's already there, or mm, that's really good. You think the community would be okay if I edited and made version two of it so that it also includes X, Y, Z. Um, then I want I want to be able to go back to my stuff and say, instead of biological nature V1, I want to actually attach the biological nature V3 because that's actually more nuanced, it's better, it's got some, some teeth, that something that I haven't had. That automatically changes the quality of my book without having written a single word, right? 
because now I'm connected to something that's foundationally has more teeth or, 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 or nuance or whatever the case may be. Does that reflect what you guys are thinking? Because to me, the editorial process isn't so much about the, the writing at the end in the Neo book, but the building block piece at the beginning, the foundational piece at the beginning, because now we're talking about community to organize how we're going to support what we're about to write rather than simply here, let me write a whole bunch of stuff and then support it later or, or never supported necessarily <laughs> other than in the writing. Mm -hmm. Um, super interesting. And I love how you, uh, thanks for drawing a, 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 an illustration of it and showing us that that's really cool. Uh, I think I'm along with you a lot and I'll generalize it a little bit in the sense of, for me, the whole manuscript of a, uh, a Neo book is composed of nuggets, some of which are just connective tissue words that like bridge, they're not important. They're just like telling a story it's, or they might be a, a little anecdote that can stand on its own. That's a nugget, but it's not important. It's just an illust illustrative nugget. And then we get to others. But every one of them, if you want to look at this in nugget view, every one of them is highlighted and has metadata and has other kinds of things. A few of those would have a big star, a big affordance of some sort that says, this nugget is foundational to Jose. This, this nugget is a foundational one, not just to Jose, but to this large community of people who have connected up and decided to, to sort of make this a really central piece because they agree on this. And, and by the way, this process is to me what democracy should feel like. So I just sent a note out to the list saying, hey, we're going to have these four calls on democracy. What I like about Neo books in there, if this were wildly successful, <clears throat> is that the thing we're talking about right now would be the way people and communities debate issues like immigration reform, policing, uh, you know, drug dependence and cleanup, all those kinds of things, right? Those are hugely important social things that lots of people write editorials and books about, but those things don't ever really converge. They don't come together. Every now and then, like Thomas Edsall is, a, is an older columnist, older white columnist for the New York Times. He writes these really long, very long, very link-rich um, articles about important issues. And I don't usually have time to read them all, but boy, he is going back to the science. He, here, I interviewed these two social scientists who wrote this really good book. Here's the essence of what they did and how it fits into my argument. He's doing this only on a old school, you know, uh, newspaper article kind of basis, but if we can do this properly, and if the communities that come around and collaborate to, to elaborate these nuggets do their job well, then we're, we're doing the same as Wikipedia, only better and more in a, in a different realm in some sense, because Wikipedia is just an encyclopedia, where this yeah. is discourse about all of the issues that would build on, it does not ignore Wikipedia, but builds on it because it's like, hey, if you want to know about watershed regulations, here's the page on that. You know, in Wikipedia, or if you want to know about uh, gra uh, controlled grazing or whatever else it is, here's a page on that. Um, but this is the the potential of this project is actually in in the dynamics you're just describing. But I think that every nugget is sort of equal to the interface to the software, and some of the nuggets are are called out as special or foundational because of the person who whose opinion I'm looking at right now on that nugget so and the community. Yeah. Yes. And the community. Bingo. So so what I what what I'm hearing is is that um perhaps unique, perhaps not. Um the conception of a neo book is that um it will be communal, not just in the evolution, but also in the birthing. In other words, there will be input in the emergence of what it is the author um, wants to say. Um, there'll be input in that, and then also in once it's said in the in the in the evolution of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, pr probably, but not always. I think some authors, yeah. mm -hmm. some authors will just write their damn book, and if they decide to make it a neo book, they might then post it pre-publication out, and other people might say, oh 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 this stretch of your book is just like this nugget that we've been working on. 
what do you want to connect it? Do you want to replace it? Whatever else that could happen. But I can think of a lot of writers because of how we've written books might want to be the solitary offer, author of a work. And they might be intrigued by the neo book thing, but not want to create in that yeah. mode. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Agree. So, so what, what I'm kind of saying is that not every author is going to be happy about being interrupted. Like, oh, the thing you just wrote is over here. It's like, yeah, stop. I'm trying to write a book. But, 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 if I would we're going, but if we're going to, I think, if, if what we're going to do is build a community of nuggets, then uh, having a, a, a formal process of, of saying, hey, you want to start a project? Here's kind of how you could do it. Um, you could meet with people, or you could, um, uh, you know, read this thing and watch this video, and da, 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 and you could figure out, you know, sort of what are your foundational blocks, and here's how you can sort of do that, and how those foundational blocks have led to other writings, so you can see how other people use those blocks, because you know, there's five people that already use this block, and here's how they framed it um, that could educate you. Um, I think that's the culture that a neo books would want to build, not one of, oh, you already have a book connected to the community, um, and, and kind of do it in an ad hoc way where you're not actually using the communal pools, the communal blocks that are really going to provide you us as a world, a new way of seeing ideas and dealing with ideas rather than as an individual expressing his thoughts as a community building on knowledge structures totally agree this this is about how do communities do sense making as much as anything else i totally agree Claus, it looked like you wanted to jump in no okay um huh that was that was hugely interesting and useful for me. Um, just hearing how you're seeing it and what you would what you would envision, and us sort of negotiating what we mean by by all the dynamics. And this this is very very much about community wisdom, like shared wisdom. How, how do we how do we make shared wisdom a little bit more permanent and more improvable? And we're building on each other, not oh let me throw away your book and go write my own because. Fuck you, 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 you know, you're just writing a book and it's all about you. And um, and if I disagree with your opinion, I might park my nugget opposite your nugget in an argumentation map. The exactly. pros and cons on the same issue. Exactly. And, and that's how we should actually be talking this thing forward. And and if somebody says, Oh, Stuart's idea on this nugget is actually the one that resonates with us, then it goes down and and you know, my idea doesn't doesn't resonate. I learned a lesson. Maybe I need to move over to Stuart's idea because it makes more sense. And then we could proxy our votes over to Stuart and he could represent us in some kind of larger decision-making process that's more official. And that's how this can affect democracy and elections. Go ahead, Stuart. You no, clearly are laughing. You I want just, to jump in. I just, I just went to a place of sensuality, Jerry. When you oh, start wow. How'd that about, happen? When you started talking about one person parking their nugget next to another person. <laughs> I love you, Stuart, but uh, please do not park your nugget anywhere near me. <laughs> keep our nuggets clear. That's very funny. Um, good. What what else do we want to talk about on this topic? Go ahead. What I was going to say, the other thing that, that emerged to me when I was thinking about building blocks. Uh, so my background is in architecture when I was very, very young. And um, you build a foundation. Well, first you prep the soil, then you build the foundation. First you choose and, a site. Yeah. Um, and, and then you start building affordances on top of that foundation that meet the needs of the inhabitants or, or the users of that space, right? Um, so to your point about that there is, there are pieces that, sit on top of it that are structural, they're still structural. They may not be foundational, but they're structural. And then there are pieces that are uh, less about the structure and more about the aesthetics and the usability 
and the you know the the um flair of the occupant right i would really love this thing in mm -hmm. in this room that has nothing to do with the structure uh but it has to do with the aesthetics or, or the, the how i wish to use this space and i think to me that again that's just because of how i think but maybe uh whether we use that language or not using that kind of conceptual structure helps us to define what elements we have in in these components so uh, a nugget is a foundational block or is a structural block or is a functional block or is an aesthetic block or it's a flow through block that gets us gets us in and out of different spaces, gets us in and out of different structural elements and so on and so forth. To me, building that, if that's what you guys meant by taxonomy, um, then that, that, that I think is a great first starting point. Um, maybe three things to reply with. Oops, uh, there we go. Um, one, let me, <clears throat> let me extend your metaphor <clears throat> because when you're pouring <clears throat> the foundation for a house or a building, you have to um, leave room for sewage pipes, electrical plumbing, like they, there's a whole bunch of infrastructure that if you don't put it in at the foundation stage, you are screwed later on and you'll be drilling through, you'll be drilling through stuff that you don't want to drill through to try to add, hey Pete, we're having a very juicy conversation about the some of the pieces that we were um, on before. Uh, yeah, uh, th thanks for, th for joining up. Um, and I'm just replying to Jose on, on a couple different things. So when Pete and I were on the digression about the taxonomy of how do we how do we uh, sort of comment and stuff like that, that was, hey, what size what size um, uh, conduit and what kind of pipe do we need to put into the foundational software of the NeoBook system so that people understand this? And when I put in the chat uh, something I've said a couple times here, which is the, the the trope of cut, copy, paste, which we take for granted now because the keyboard has XCV, it's, which is really handy, and everybody knows how to cut, copy, paste text between applications, which didn't used to happen until a few people wrote software that, that standardized how cut, copy, paste work across applications, all of that. Part of my hope is that the more complicated aspects of how we collaborate around these nuggets or blocks um, will involve a similarly simple trope that I don't know yet. I, I have not invented it or envisioned it, but it should be simpler than it is right now to figure out how do I want to engage with this piece and how can I help or how can I reuse it or whatever else that might be. And I, I'm hoping that that becomes kind of a trope. But the reason for some of these more abstract conversations was that we were trying to architect or engineer the foundational bits of the software that we're using so that later, once we've got a book and once people show up to say, okay, great, you attracted me with the book, I'm ready to talk around the nuggets as part of your community, we had something to offer them that worked well. And I think it's only going to work well if those of us composing nuggets as if they were interactive nuggets early on actually right with those affordances present we, we like we need those things sooner not later not added in when people show up to, to re really talk we need the, the talking bits need to be evolved um, very early in the process and need to be better than and more than fork and pull on github which is what we've currently got as a default setting and so really what you're talking about is using continuing with my building metaphor you're talking about what tools we can use uh, on these blocks. Bingo. What what are what are the um, what's the equipment that yep. we have with which to interact with them? And it's um, very much like my friend Doc Searles is building a house in Bloomington, Indiana, and he's trying to. He asked a question in one of the groups I'm in. Hey, do I put Cat Five in? Do I put fiber in the walls? Like like. I want to have a nicely wired house. Do I just do wireless and not worry about, about conduits at all in the walls? That was an infrastructure question that is appropriate right now because technology has moved ahead and blah, 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 blah. Because 20 years ago, you would have laid as much Cat5 as you possibly could because you were like, oh, 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 I want to have like fancy internet to all my rooms. But that, yep. that's the, it's a there, different done question that. today. It's a different question today, right? <laughs> but but that's, so Pete and I were having that question about how do we do conversations around nuggets? 
So what, what's popping up for me is um, some kind of a primer for writers so that at the beginning of the process, if someone wants to create some new conception, they're aware of how this will develop, um, expand, um, so that a writer can 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 put that um, into the mix as they're creating text and addressing certain topics. Mm -hmm. And I've started a page that's sort of like that, but I I, I think not as not as focused as what you just said. But um, yes, and maybe the throwing this out. I'm not sure this makes any sense, but uh, continuing with the building metaphor. Uh, maybe the thing that is interesting as a starting point is a um, a conceptual soil in which uh, any of these blocks are built on. Um, which I think a, is part of the taxonomy that Pete and I were talking about, and which was a little a segment of that, not the entire picture, but a piece of that was that. I I, I just want to add a brief personal story about you know understanding infrastructure and the um the building metaphor my my first real job um at the age of 15 working for my father who was a plumbing and heating contractor um i spent the entire summer sitting on my ass with a hammer and chisel um <laughs> working my way through four inch concrete floors because they forgot to put the sleeves in for the piping in the hospital. Oh, oh, <laughs> awful. Yeah. Yeah, and um, we wound up having to uh, partially demolish a half-built home up here, here in the hills of Fremont, California, um, in order to put extra pilings in it, uh, because the pilings that were driven down uh, had not um been sufficient for what the structure was based on the soil conditions mm -hmm. so uh, <laughs> you know it, it it's it's a number of factors when you uh when you start looking at structural needs and that's i think the the interesting question is how do we look at it holistically first uh to understand i think the questions that that uh jerry and, and peter talking about and then and then drill down into some of those things, no pun intended, um, to figure out how do we how do we structure them. Um, I, I I'm getting more excited about this, guys, because it feels like we're on the same page, and I especially love the fact that this would not be um, a, a system of me building a book, but a community driven way of building knowledge and conceptual integrity behind things that are being written and that that conceptual integrity resonates with the community thanks to say i just pasted a link to a really unfinished page that points to the taxonomy page pete put up um, that is meant to be a, hey, I'd like to write a neo book. How do I go about doing this kind of thing? And I think I have a couple others that are related that I need to bring together uh, into the primer that we're talking about here. So I think there's probably one page page or pages needed for why on earth would you want to do a neo book? Like, and, and I, I've got what's a neo book and why are nuggets powerful? That That's kind of, there's a neo books introduction page. Uh, and there's a why nuggets are powerful page, which I need to update from from stuff we've just figured out in this conversation. But then there also needs to be a okay, I'd like to jump in. How do I do this dance with you uh, page as well? Yeah. So you'd like to write a neo book question mark. Cool. Um, Pete, we started with um, me saying that me apologizing for bringing up the tech the uh, uh, core. Uh, cooperative authoring topic last time and debriefing that that I, I think that you and I were like, yeah, 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 let's do this. And I'm not sure everybody else was was on board. Uh, then we went into um, uh, some impatience with, hey, we need to like produce neobooks. And then we had a, a lot of really interesting sort of 
uh, layering and expanding of what do we mean by the different dynamics that we've been talking about um, and, and coming back into like we mostly, I think, agree on on how these dynamics ought to work. And we're also mostly impatient to, to go get books. I also stated in the middle of it that we don't have the resources to do proper editing right now. Uh, you know, Pete, you and I talked about how do we divide up what we can do to try to edit manuscripts and so forth, but we we don't have a successful way to crowd crowdsource, for example, good, useful edits of the many kinds that are needed for a manuscript to look really top notch like a published book. So uh, what do we do in the meantime is a realistic uh, question. I just, uh, something just entered my mind as, as you said that, Jerry. Um, if we have a bunch of foundational nuggets built into a neobook uh, and those foundational nuggets have examples are tied to pre-existing different writings that reflect the essence uh, of those foundational uh, blocks. Would AI be able to then say, okay, so you're using this block because you explicitly say you're using this, this block uh, here, 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 and there. Uh, I'm going to do an edit of this or derive a bunch of questions around what's not coherent with how that block pre-existing may be that you're adding something new to it and then suggest shouldn't a block. So I write a whole bunch of stuff and say, this belongs to that block. And then it says, uh, well, yeah, but maybe this needs to be added to that block. Why don't you vet the community? with the community, these questions, in order for that block to then really be consistent with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, th that might be a really interesting, as we're writing, a way to get more community involvement from suggestions that the AI actually generates or questions that the AI generates as we're writing. I think, I think I'm only beginning to think through the many ways that AIs could help us do this whole process. And I'm I'm clearly fighting the trope that, hey, Gen AI basically obsoletes note taking and humans making nuggets and writing books and all that kind of stuff. We're not we're not even going to buy books anymore. We're going to chat to books, uh, which are going to be the ex excerpts of the contents of the ideas in people's heads. And I got to say that um, earlier when Klaus was like, what, you know, uh, uh, he put a link, Pete, in the chat to pi.ai slash uh, uh, explore, I think, uh, which is one interesting, simple interface for exploring books. And if we bypass books altogether and had a, a, an enthusiastic community creating nuggets that interacted and then wired Gen AI to that, we would kind of have that. We, we, we could just ignore the whole book expression thing altogether. For me, I call I, I called this neo books, and I'm interested in producing what look like books because I think books are the calling card and the thing that will attract people to the project. They're like, oh, smart people write books. But I'm I'm I would rather be in the thick of the discussions and wire AI in so that we can just have people talk to the ideas and then see what the AI suggests as improvements for you know nugget consolidation, crystallization. Uh, even the, the cleaving of, I mean, if if Gen AI understood how nug, how to nuggetize well, and we could then stick it on a corpus of of things and and improve them from a nuggetized perspective, that's a that's a really cool benefit. Uh, because yeah. one of our problems here is how do we separate one idea from the next? How do we link them when they're related? How do we allow them to be neighbors when they're different? Right. I think all, all those things are super interesting questions that AI could be very helpful with. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> this concept of book, Jerry, I, I understand why it, it, it's it's a foundational piece, but um, this might be a better way to think of this whole project as um, curators of content. Okay. Our communi knowledge communities. Uh... Um, yeah. Uh, what was uh, Doug Engelbart had a term? Knowledge something communities. Nick's. Mm -hmm. um that that's kind of what we're trying to design here very much yeah I, and and I, that's a great thing to consider um go ahead Klaus. 
Yeah, to give you an example, how how I interact with the AI, uh, Jean sent me a note, Jean Ballinger sent me a note with a book written by Bill Gates. And I ran it through my Neobook reviewer and you know, had just uh, peddled, I mean, uh, mess, mess, messed with it a little bit and sent it back to him. Um, here's what AI thinks about this. And he goes, well, what do you think? So I went back um, and and I asked, I asked, uh, given instructions, elaborate on the criticism of the book. And it came up with a whole list of uh, critical components. And then, you know, Gene is the, the uh, ultimate questionnaire. You know, <laughs> he has this Socratic way of uh, uh, asking questions that uh, just pulls you along. And so, so then the next question, well, well, what's missing in this critique since AI is basically rehashing what everybody already knows or what's out there, you know, so uh, what would the AI say about missing in there? Well, the AI, AI doesn't say a darn thing about what's missing in there. Um, but I asked it a question and as to say, is it a fair assumption that Bill Gates is basically divorced from the reality of nature as a living thing, you know the, that that nature is alive, uh, and that he looks at nature from a mechanical perspective. And the AI then came back and concurred, you know, that indeed, um, uh, you know, he seems to interpret nature as uh, something that can be manipulated and uh, and dealt with. So. So you're moving, so when, when you see these questions, it's not that AI will give you an automatic answer. You have to you have to guide it with your hypothesis you know, to, to move into the next stage. And then it will either um, agree or disagree with what you're saying. Um, but that's how you how you uh, uh, sort of uh, test your way along the topics. Um, but then otherwise, I would say nuggets, um, they come out automatically. I wouldn't worry about uh, what is a nugget and what is not as you're writing. You know, that what 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 turns into a nugget will come out later when you reread your own work and you say, oh, that's really a freestanding topic here, or it could be, and maybe I need to elaborate it a little bit. But the discussion of nuggets, I think, is secondary to writing the book, you now and then understanding how it breaks down into subtopics that uh, could that could be allocated to different conversations. I, I think I mostly agree with you, Klaus, and I certainly don't want to distract somebody who just wants to sit down and write a book. But I find myself thinking nuggetly, I, writing wickily. I find myself changing how I write to make better nuggets along the way. Uh, and I would love the, those nuggets to sort of test their logic and their worth in the marketplace of ideas as people collaborate with the emerging manuscript before it ever becomes a book. Uh, I, I would really like that. So, so that means that the nuggets might actually change a bit, a bunch before my manuscript is done, for example. Um, and that's a that's a longer conversation, I think, to, to an, in, an interesting one to have. Um, Pete. Uh, thanks. <clears throat> um, real quick on nuggets, and then um, thinking through Jose's question about uh, could could an AI do, um, and then uh, if folks are interested, I can give like a three or four minute report. On, I was late because Jordan and I were having fun working on publishing a book, um, and I can do a, a quick report on that. Um, if it doesn't disrupt the flow of conversation. So the I, uh, I, I like your thinking about nuggets, Klaus. And I think maybe a, a, a zoom out maybe is that uh, nugget, nuggetizing and writing shouldn't conflict with each other. Um, I think some people, um, I think actually when I write, I, I write nuggets first and then I fill in the nuggets. Um, and I've got a... A kind of a workflow that I think of for especially wikis, but it works for books too, 
Um, it's uh, chunking, naming, linking. So chunking is taking a bunch of undifferentiated stuff I know about a topic and saying, well, I know about this part of it, this part of this part and this part. And then if you give those a nice name, um, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the creation of the tabletop, uh, sawing wood, um, finishing the tabletop, uh, you know, different materials you could use. Those are kind of undifferentiated, in, undifferentiated, undifferentiated chunks. Then if you give them a nice name, um, you can refer to them, especially when you've got a huge number of chunks like that, you know, 100 chunks or 200 chunks. And then you go, okay, well, if I'm putting this together and I'm telling the story about somebody, I should go through these chunks first and those chunks later, and you know, I'll, I'll move this. And, and then they start getting a life of their own and they get bigger and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> when you're working in a wiki, those names are also um, the names of a page. So uh, wikis work really well with chunks and reordering chunks and sorting them and stuff like that. So um, I think it's kind of both and, you know, you, you sometimes you work from the bottom up and sometimes you work from the top down and whatever makes sense. Um, uh, Jose, your thought about AI is, is really smart and I think it's really good. Um, I think <clears throat> the way I like to say how um, uh, the way I like to say it is how would a human do this with the help of an AI? So if in, in my mind, when I say AI, uh, I kind of immediately expand that to a power tool for language, you know, a chat, chat AI. So how would I, you know, how would a human use a, uh, a power tool for language to, um, make this into chunks? Um, look at this chunk. Uh, I'm going to use chunk and nugget a little bit interchangeably. Uh, look at this chunk and this chunk and reword these two to fit these other six. So that kind of stuff is something that Chatbot is really good at. And the, the thing to be mindful about is that you can't say, here, AI, fix this. But kind of like Klaus said, you can say, AI, can you help me make this make more sense with that? Or what's missing from this? Or those kinds of things. So... Mm -hmm. The, the agency there is not the AI, the agency is resident within the human and the human is using a power tool to go, okay, I need this bunch of text to get bigger, smaller, turn into different pieces, whatever. Um, so let me give a, a quick recap of uh, Jordan and Pete publishing a book. This was our second meeting. Um, today, we kind of like looked around and we decided, well, Let's do poll planning uh, is what Jordan calls it. Let's do backcasting from where we want to be to see what we need to do. Um, Jordan is interested in publishing via Lulu, uh, which I think is an Ingram thing. Um, no, it's you can independent. Either... Well, at least it was independent. I guess, well, they end up... It was Good done by the question. founder of uh, Red Hat. I feel like... Well, yeah, okay. Bob, Bob Young, Good. Lulu Enterprises. Bob Young, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. it, it, it leans on top of Ingram's distribution, um, maybe, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I apologize. You're right. It's, it's an independent thing. So anyway, if you publish, so, uh, you know, one of the first questions in publishing is a Lulu or KD or KDP or Lulu, you know, everybody does KDP, KDP, Kindle, whatever publishing, um, means that Amazon will publish it, make it really easy for you. And then you can't sell it anywhere else. Um, at least without reproducing the book. Um, so Lulu is the other way around. Uh, you produce it once in Lulu, and then it goes to Ingram for distribution to a bunch of different places, including Amazon and uh, iBooks uh, and your own website if you want, and lulu.com. Uh, uh, I, I didn't realize this, but they have a bookstore that you can go to and buy stuff. So um, uh, Jordan wants to use Lulu. Uh, so we said, okay, well, um, uh, so starting from zero, like we know nothing about Lulu, um, uh, we made uh, a Lionsburg account on Lulu, and then we stepped through the process of making a book, uh, and uh, we got we got all the way through it in you know an hour or so uh, from zero content literally to uh, if you click this button, the book is going to be in in stores. <laughs> um, <laughs> We didn't click that button because we had made kind of a junk book. Um, but uh, the junk book was actually written with ChatGPT three and a half because it's faster. 
Um, uh, it actually came out to be a pretty good book. I, I would actually read it. Um, it was about um, Critical Path, the, uh, the Buckminster Fuller book, um, and Max uh, and his, uh, his discovery of the book and learning about it and things like that. Um, it, we just wrote up some sample content using ChatGPT. So the, um, it actually went all really smoothly. The main uh, learnings that we have is that uh, Lulu's going to want, um, you, you kind of end up wanting to use either Microsoft Word or Adobe InDesign. Uh, Microsoft Word for straightforward books uh, that aren't too, too complicated and, and InDesign for lots of page formatting like a coffee table book or you know, um, something like that. Um, I wanted to try using Google Docs instead of Microsoft Word, and we think we might have identified a problem um, uh, there. We, we took a, a Microsoft Word template from Lulu for the right uh, page size that we wanted. Then we copied our content in, you know, we loaded that in Google Docs. We copied the content into that Google Doc, fixed it up a tiny bit, and then said, save to, save to PDF. Lulu takes a PDF. So when we loaded the PDF and it did the preview, some of the lines ran over the, the margin area. Um, it was still, it still fit in the page. I think it would print, but it was a little bit ugly. So um, our next step is to try um, official Microsoft Word. Um, uh, but I was pleasantly surprised that the whole process was pretty straightforward and, and easy to do. Um, they have an option. We thought we would need an ISBN going in, uh, ISBN is a standard book number for publishing. Um, they will uh, give you a free ISBN, um, which comes out under the Lulu imprint, which is okay for onesie twosies. Um, Jordan would prefer to have all his books under the Lionsburg imprint, so he'll have his own ISBNs, um, but went pretty well. That's awesome. So hey, we're, we're close. Yeah. That many questions, comments, thoughts? Repeat on that. Uh, just uh, as as uh, Pete was talking about it, I started imagining um, books uh, under this might be much smaller and much more consumable. Um, our social media habits might dictate that what we do is not write large books uh, with lots of uh, foundational blocks, but smaller books with small, fewer number of foundational blocks that have that are consumable, easy, and allow us to interact with with uh, the nuggets in a way that are not um, as complex as our books are today. Um, and and it might actually appeal to younger folks as what a book could be mm -hmm. um, in, in in a different way. So it's just just something that occurred to me. I, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, mm -hmm. it seems like it it reflects what where we're going socially. So the, the go ahead, sir. The trend has been over the past ten years or so to go with um, smaller books with more white space and more graphics. Because the truth is that, I don't know the exact number, but something like 90% of books purchased are read, written never read. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But wait, I've that's, heard, that, I've heard that's a similar number. The, that's Pardon? after the terrible stats about how many books actually ever get sold. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, I, I think it's like 78% of um, ebooks never actually get read. Makes good sense, I guess. Well, it's it's a very similar with you know with with printed books with physical books, people buy them and don't read them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not can... we're not really sorry. I was just going to say we're not really passing along information if that's what we're hap is what's happening. Right. So the idea of 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 delivering content in in more consumable format is very congruent. With some of the trends in the in the in the book publishing industry, mm -hmm. um, Pete. Then I wanted to add a little comment, and then Klaus, and I will need to leave at the top of the hour sharp. Me too. I, I like your your intuition, your provocation there, Jose. But um, <clears throat> I would I would uh, offer offer a, a different one. 
not not uh, not disagree. A different one would be that uh, if you're actually making a book, um, you can actually make them longer and more rich uh, nowadays because you know that the content in it is going out a bunch of different ways. So a new book, the, the print version of a new book might be a classical book. It might be a two or 300 pager with lots of rich detail and all kinds of stuff. Um, and that same content goes out in social media and Substack posts and, you know, PDFs of each chapter and, and stuff like that. So the, the social media, um, uh, social media attraction you've got there or, or, or mode modality, you actually do in social media um, and not in print. And that frees up the print one to be like a, a nice print book. Um, and then the, the reason we make books nowadays is not so much to, I mean, be, be, because of what we just talked about, you know, people don't read books. Um, books are made to make a statement or to talk to the future or, you know, to be a marketing piece or something like that. So, you know, those, those kinds of things don't, you don't need a small book for that. And actually a big book is, is kind of better. So I, I, both ways work. Um, thanks, Pete. To follow along on that, the, the, part of the notion on uh, neobooks is that uh, neobooks are, uh, uh, that a book is just a playlist of nuggets. <clears throat> and so it could be long or short, kind of doesn't matter. Uh, you could in fact publish the same neobook at three different levels of depth where one of them follows all the tendrils out and includes a bunch of other resources from other people. And it might be a thousand page book, but it's a, it's a, it's a conclusive narrative, linearized narrative, because that's what books do, that has a lot of materials in it. And then there could be a uh, you know, 10,000 word version of the same exact book that only publishes the topmost level uh, nuggets. Uh, and then if you went to the online artifact, you could find your way through the whole forest of, of linked, uh, linked topics, et cetera. Um, second thing I wanted to say is that April and I on Friday watched the movie Origin, which is the dramatization of Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast. And it, it you you, re, you start reading cast and you're like, there ain't no way this could be a book. And they did a very, Ava DuVernay did the script and was the director, did a brilliant job of making a movie out of it by dramatizing Isabel's life and weaving it into instances of cast problems worldwide. <clears throat> and, and, and Isabel proves her thesis for me really, really well. And her thesis partly is, hey folks, the problem isn't racism, it's actually caste, which is some artificial structure by which we make some people inferior to other people and then institutionalize it everywhere. And she, she plays that out really well. She has the eight pillars of caste, which I put in my brain this morning uh, because that's one of the nice sort of systemic things she, she talks about, about how caste gets done. And she had only ever published one book before that. She was a one book author who was out on the speaking circuit, which is a part of the beginning of the book. She's she's out giving speeches on her one book. And the, the movie is the story of her coming up with this other book. And I'm like, wow, that's one person's career with two books. And, and and some people die having written one great book, and that's the thing they did. Stewart has written a bunch of books and but written one, and, and co-authored as well. But the one great book was a Pulitzer Prize winning book. Um, the first the first one, which yeah. after after I saw the movie Origin, I, I had never read it. It's the story of the the um the black migration from south to north in the US. Uh, I pulled out the book because I decided that I, I actually wanted to read it. So it's it's it, it, it's back in the queue. Thank so you. you've you've upped the frequent or the chances that that book is being read. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. But yeah. so, so just to talk, just to say a little bit about size of books, uh, frequency of anybody touching books, whatever. I'm really interested in, in us upping the, the frequency of people interacting about all the wisdom that's buried in books these days. Sorry about that, Klaus. Go ahead. Yeah, so as I'm following the conversation, I have I have a few questions. Is the idea of having an OGM URL website that contains neo books uh, something that makes sense? I mean, is there a place where we can combine everybody, give them uh, a space, and uh, create uh, a neo book uh, page? That's one question. Then the other thing is, Pete. Uh, now, as you are going with your book here and you publish via Lulu, 
does that fit into the scheme of consolidating neo books under an umbrella? Uh, do all the other neo books then also go into Lulu format, or uh, is there something? How how do we go about this from a technical, basic perspective? I mean, where, how do we get from here? You know, talking about you know a lot of uh, technical things to let's actually do something and and uh, uh, not make a project out of it and just and then and then you know don't overthink it. If you get it right. 50, 60 percent, that's fantastic, right? And we can fiddle with it and advance it further. But we have been going for quite a while now. Um, it would be awesome yeah, to actually see a product um, that becomes sort of tangible um, and that we can play with. Um, two things quickly. Pete was just part of a project that he talked about last week, I think, where they wrote a book in a month, roughly, I don't know, two months? But a bunch of people compiled volumes and got a book out that's available on Kindle. You can go buy it right now. Sorry, not on Kindle. It's available as a paper bound, which I don't understand at all. Anyway, um, I try. I signed up for KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing, a while ago. But it turns out that if you do that, KDP only wants you to publish a Kindle book. The reason to go to Lulu is that it gives you avenue into a variety of different publishing environments. And, and Pete is busy doing the footwork for researching the technical aspects that you just pointed to class as being thorny. It's like, yep. And if we solve a couple of these well enough, then the first couple of books can go maybe through Lulu. And then after that, we discover something else or create something. I don't know. But but I, but Pete is actually doing the, the the footwork to figure out which of these channels is makes the most sense for us. Rather than the channel conversation, uh, the uh, sorry, Jerry, you have to go. Yep. Is new books a publishing press? Or is it a process? And right. and my answer, I think, is actually it's both. But it'd be interesting here. Awesome. I'm, want... I'm going to bounce and pass the con to who's going to stay the longest on this call. I'm, I'm out of here I'm as well. To, I'm ready to go. But I wanted to okay. say quickly before you guys leave, what I'm hearing is, is that we're coming to a publishing process, whatever that means, that we're getting we're getting closer. So Pete, yes. thank, you, thank you for coming on. I also wanted to show you a little bit person's first for, this is the first one, okay? The War of the Wars, <clears throat> Wars of the Sun. It's it's six hundred and fifty pages. That's all. <laughs> Looks like more. Looks like more. <laughs> Thanks, Bye, guys. guys. Great call. Thank you.